Uh, I don't have a whole lot of time, um, but I want to go through the Song of Moses. And I want people to listen, because I'm, I'm going to get through as much as I can. There's a lot in here. Um, I'm going to point out the key phrases, the key words that people need to look up. Some of them I'm going to go to and read. Um, might have to be like a, a two-part series here, but again, I want to make sure that people understand this is not just about keeping the Ten Commandments. The Messiah said all of the law and all of the prophets hang off of the Ten, okay? So everything from Luke 24, 44 through 45, where the Messiah said that all things that were written in the law and the prophets were concerning him, then he opened the understanding of his disciples that they might understand the scripture. Now, think about that for a second, because they were walking with the Messiah. They were doing miracles, and they were doing all kinds of stuff. They witnessed all kinds of stuff with the Messiah. And we've gone through the teaching of uh, Peter's vision and all of that. It took them a long time to grasp what the Messiah was teaching them while he was on the earth with them. So while they, while they were with him for that three-year period, they were learning, but it wasn't, it hadn't sunken in. And this, for anybody who wants to be a teacher, you guys should understand this, that if you're going to jump into a position of teaching, you ought to understand the law, the prophets, the Psalms, and everything that they've manipulated in the word. This goes all the way back to the scribes altering the word and changing things. And people will bring up books that they don't like to read that are outside of the 66 book canon and they read them thinking that they're going to understand them without realizing if you don't have an understanding of the law and the prophets that are in the 66 book canon there's no way you're going to understand the parables that are in these other books enoch jubilees jasher i mean i go on and on and on but those books the parables in those books alone are for those that are well learned in scripture so Deuteronomy 32, I want to make sure that people understand this. This is called the Song of Moses, okay? So this isn't going to change. And I'm going to show you guys. First, we're going to go to Revelation chapter 5. Uh, I'm going to start from verse 1. And we're going to see this 144,000. I'm going to go to a couple different places uh, throughout the book so that people can understand Number one, actually, let's, let's go back to Revelation chapter 3 first, because I want to read about the church of Philadelphia, and these churches are addressing the seven continents, okay? And it's, there's much more to it than that, but I'm just going to leave it there for now because I want to get into this and be able to get through a good portion of what we're about to cover. Um, let's see. We'll start in verse 7 of uh, Revelation chapter 3. It says, And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, and he that is true, he that hath the key of David, and he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. Okay? So this key of David is being thrown around as an excuse for people to do whatever they feel like doing on the, on the Sabbath. If you're going to teach people on the Sabbath, that doesn't mean you go and run into a church and cause all types of disturbances and all of that. That's not operating in love. That's operating out of your own calling. These are self-proclaimed people saying that, oh, we have this and we have that. If you're boasting in that, you have an issue already. So the Messiah is making it clear. He's addressing the church of Philadelphia and he's saying, he has the key of David, okay? Verse 8, he says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast little strength. Why do they have little strength? Well, it's very clear. We were warned that Satan was going to wear out the saints of the Most High. So by the time we get to mid-tribulation, those that are wise, remember, we talked about this in other books, those that are wise, second Baruch, during this time, they're going to become quiet. And the quietness is not only because of the fact that people are going to be 
they're going to have their ears plugged. They're not going to want to hear anything. But it's, it's also because the remnant is going to be removed at the mid-tribulation point. So there's a lot of people saying they have the key of David and that they're part of the 144,000, yet none of these people know where to go. They think they're going to stay here and ride this out and the Father's going to protect them. That's not how it works. Uh, okay, so he says, For thou hast little strength and hast kept my word. What does the word mean? Torah. And has not denied my name. Okay, so the, the son is the one that's addressing here. Because at the end of each addressing of the church, he says, To him that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He's talking about his father, right? He's still speaking on behalf of his father, and he's still ruling and reigning. And we can read about this in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 21 through 27. The Messiah does not give up his authority and rule and reign and hand that authority back to the father until after the thousand-year millennial reign is over. So he still has authority. And remember, he told us that when he was walking the earth. All authority has been given to me by my father, which is in heaven, okay? Uh, let's see, verse 9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before your feet to know that I have loved you. Now, he's speaking to a particular group of people here, right? It's pretty clear. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, we can read about this in Revelation as well. He says, here is the perseverance or the patience of the saints, those that keep the commandments of the Father and have the testimony of Yeshua the Messiah. So if you're not keeping the, the, the commandments and the laws that are attached to those commandments and you don't understand prophecy, then you're not keeping the word of his patience. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. So for people that think they're going to get raptured out of here, that's not going to happen. The only people that are kept from that hour, which is not the indignation, it's the wrath, the second part of tribulation. The remnant will be hidden away. They'll be kept from uh, all of the disastrous things that are going to happen on the earth. But this is specifically speaking to the 144,000. So he's saying, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. No mention of a rapture. Doesn't say the Christians are going to be kept from this. This is addressed specifically to the 144,000. Verse 11, behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast, which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. In uh, second Esdras, Who's being crowned on the top of Mount Zion? It's the 144, correct? So who's being crowned as kings and priests of the new earth? Is it everybody? Verse 12. To him that overcometh will I make a pillar of the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. Revelation 21 explains who the pillars are, right? People read Revelation 21 thinking it's talking about an actual temple. It's talking about people. I will make a pillar of the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, Yahweh, the Torah, <laughs> and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. So are we going to heaven when we die, or does heaven come to the new earth after the thousand-year millennial reign, according to Revelation 21, and according to all the prophets. And I will write upon him my new name. So he's saying he's going to write upon us the name of his God, and he will write upon us his new name. The Father and the Son. The Father's word, and then you have the faithful witness the patience, the perseverance of the saints, those that keep the commandments of the Most High and have the testimony of His Son. He that hath an ear, remember those that have ears and hear not, and those that have eyes and see not, because their eyes are being darkened, because they don't want to hear the truth. 
let them hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Okay? So, that's just the church of Philadelphia. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 5. Verse starting in verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside. Remember, we were reading about this book uh, in, was it, yeah, Zechariah, right? When Satan is standing before the Messiah to resist him. And the angel is asking Zechariah, what do you see? And he says, I see a scroll written on the front thereon and written on the back thereon, right? The commandments. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and loosen the seals thereof? And no man in heaven, nor in earth, nor under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book, and loose the seven seals thereof. Now, who is this lion of the tribe of Judah? Well, we got Revelation 22, verse 16. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So we see this uh, lamb that's been slain coming out of the midst of the candlesticks. We study this as well in Zephaniah, right? Where explained where he said, I will search thee out with candles, angels. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and the four creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as if it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of Yahweh sent forth into the whole earth. Zephaniah chapter 4. The angel asks Zephaniah, what, or Zechariah, what do you see? And Zechariah says, um, or actually no, he's talking about Zerubbabel. And then he says, Behold, my servant Zerubbabel, he has laid the foundation of this house, and his hands will finish it. And then he also talks about the angels, right? So let's go there really quickly, because I, I want to show you guys how all of this stuff connects. And when people are jumping into the book of Revelation, they're making assumptions. They're not understanding what they're reading unless they've gone through the prophecies, right? All right, so... Uh, Zechariah chapter 4, and this is the, the prophecy of the Messiah, starting in verse 6. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of Yahweh unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by power, nor by my might, but by my spirit, say, saith Yahweh of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying grace, grace unto it. This is Revelation 20. Satan is going to be destroyed, right? He's going to be bound for a thousand years, let loose, and he's going to be destroyed. This headstone or this mountain that's standing before Zerubbabel, Yeshua, is going to be flattened like a plain. Moreover, the word of Yahweh came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands shall also finish it. And you shall know that Yahweh of hosts has sent me unto you. Who has despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice when they see the stone, the plummet, in the hand of Zerubbabel, Yeshua, which are those seven. They are the eyes of Yahweh which run to and fro through the whole earth. So why does the Messiah have seven eyes and seven horns? Well, we'll, we'll go over the horns in a little bit. The horns, again, we've, we've talked about this. It's all throughout the prophets. We even see the beast has horns, right? And these horns are raised up. We read about it in uh, Zechariah as well. It's spoken about in there. It's spoken about in all the prophets. Okay, so he, beheld, he beholds this lamb in the midst of the throne and the four creatures. In the midst of the elders stood a lamb as if it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of Yahweh, sent forth into all the earth. Who are the seven eyes or the seven candlesticks or the seven stars? 
Revelation chapter 1, the angels. And he came and took the book out of the hand of him that sat upon the throne. So the lamb comes out and he takes the book from the one who is seated upon the throne. This isn't the father taking the book out of the father's hand. This is the Messiah taking the book out of the father's hand. And when he had taken the book, the four creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. So in Revelation 8, who's offering up the prayers of the saints? It says an angel, right? Well, this is the one who has the prayers of the saints, right? The, the people that are singing, they have the golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Verse 9, listen very closely. And they, who is, who is they? The elders. This is the 144,000, the 24 elders. It says, and they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, and thou hast redeemed us uh, unto Yahweh by your blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Why? Because we're scattered into all of these places. So now let's go to Revelation chapter 8 really quickly. And then we're going to go to Revelation 15 because I want to show you this new song. Revelation 8 verse 1. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for the space of a half hour. And I saw seven angels which stood before Yahweh, and to them were given seven trumpets. Verse 3. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before Yahweh out of the angel's hand. This is your Messiah. This is what this is talking about. And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, the 144,000, and they were cast upon the earth. And a third part of the trees, people, were burnt up and all green grass was burnt up. What does Peter say? All flesh is grass. We know we've been through these studies before. We know this is not talking about Yahweh burning up the trees. This is people. The second angel sounded, and it were as it were a great mountain burning with fire that was cast into the sea, the nations. And a third part of the sea became blood, blood up to the horse's bridle. This great mountain, remember the Messiah speaking to Peter, he called him Simon Bar-Jonas, a small piece of the rock. Upon you, Peter, will I establish my church. So that small rock becomes a great burning mountain, which is cast into the earth. And two, we see now two-thirds have been burnt up, right? I'm not going to go into wormwood and the star and all of that right now because I want to cover Revelation 15. All right. Revelation 15, 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. For in them is filled up the wrath of Yahweh. When is this? These are the seven angels with the seven last plagues. This isn't the indignation. This is the wrath. This is uh, the, the, the uh, remnant has been hidden away and the 144 are already called up to the throne. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And to them that have gotten victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass having the harps of Yahweh. What is this sea of glass? It's the same place that the Messiah just walked out of as the lamb slain. They're standing above the firmament looking down at the earth. Listen to verse 3 very, very carefully. 
and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of Yahweh, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Yahweh Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, O thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Master of glory? For thou art, art thou only are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Okay, so this isn't a new song. Why? Because it tells us right here in verse 3, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of Yahweh. So you mean to tell me that the law of Moses, which was given to Moses, it's not Moses' law, it was given to Moses. You mean to tell me that in Revelation chapter 15, John is seeing the people that have victory over the beast already. They've already, they've, they've already overcome the beast. So this means if they're standing on a sea uh, of, of fire mingled with glass, we know where they're standing. They're standing on the throne above the firmament, looking down at the earth, right? They, they're witnessing all of the wrath that's being poured out at this point. And they're singing the song of Moses, the servant of Yahweh, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Yahweh Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Okay? So is this a new song? No, it's only new to those that are just hearing it. So we have to go back to Deuteronomy 32 to understand what this song is. All right, Deuteronomy 32. Give ear, O you heavens, and I will speak. Who's speaking? The Father. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Who are the words of the Father's mouth? The Messiah. He's called the Word of the Father, the Word of Yahweh. Revelation 19 and many other places. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, as the showers upon the grass. Now, what does this do? So for the people that are really interested in studying this out, all you have to do is look up the word, just do a simple word search on do, okay? Genesis 27, 28. Therefore, Yahweh will give them of the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and the plenty of corn and wine. What did we go over the other day about the corn being? Our sacrifices, the bulls and calves of our lips. It's your offering today in your temple, your body. And then the wine we've gone over, it's either good wine or bad wine. Bad doctrine, good doctrine, okay? This is all over the place. Genesis 27, 39, And Isaac and his father answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and the dew of heaven from above. Knowledge, people. This is talking about knowledge coming down. Blessings. The blessings that are in Deuteronomy 28 for keeping all of the law, not just the parts people like. I'm not going to go through all of the, the uh, verses that pertain to dew because there's a lot. I'll, I'll read this one, though. Um, uh, Song of Solomon, uh, 5, verse 2. He says, I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh. <laughs> Remember, those that stand at the door. The Messiah said, I stand at the door and knock. Those who open, he says he will come in and he will dine with you, right? which is a, another way of saying that he will give you wisdom, understanding, knowledge, okay? My beloved that standeth and knock, saying, Open to me, my sister, my beloved, my dove, my undefiled, for my head is filled with dew and my locks with the drops of the night. So again, you guys can go through this and read it. Anytime it's speaking about the dew, you're going to see very quickly, it's talking, Yahweh, every time he's talking about this, he's talking about pouring out blessings, knowledge, understanding. It's all about keeping the Torah. Everything always leads back to the Torah. The way, the truth, the light, the dew, the new wine, the latter rain, the former rain. It's all blessings from heaven. 
All right, so back to uh, Deuteronomy 32. Give ear, O you heavens, and I will speak. And hear, O you earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, and my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb. Who's the tender herb? As the showers upon the grass, all flesh is grass. Because I will publish the name of Yahweh, ascribe ye greatness unto our Elohim. Verse 4, for the people that think the Messiah is the rock, you're sadly mistaken. For he is the rock, his work is perfect, for all of his ways are judgment, an Elohim of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he, he alone. Remember the rich man coming up to the Messiah and he says, good master, what must I do to have eternal life? And the Messiah stops him and says, why do you call me good? For there is none good except my father, which is in heaven. The Messiah wouldn't say that if he were God in the flesh. Verse 5, they have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. Going back to the serpent seed, for everybody that denies it, people that keep saying, oh, no, 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 everyone's going to be accepted. Everyone's going to be allowed into the kingdom. How were they corrupting themselves? They were mixing seed. This started in Genesis chapter 3, people. And it goes on in Genesis chapter 4, Genesis chapter 5, all the way through the entirety of the Bible. Jeremiah chapter 3, the divorce decree, because they're mixing seed. The story of Pinyas, the son of Eleazar. After they just got done being punished by the father for mixing seed, Pinyas sees one of his Israelite brothers bringing a Canaanite woman into the camp. And he takes, this man takes this woman into the tent and Pinyas stands up and grabs a spear and runs into the tent and thrusts both of them, the man, his brother, and the woman with a spear through their gut, taking both of them out. Okay, so think about that for a second. And what did Yahweh say about Pinyas? That he was a righteous man. So no, not everybody's your neighbor. Same story with Moses. When Moses went out and he saw the Egyptian people, remember Moses was put in a basket in the Nile, in an ark, if you want to call it that. And then we see Pharaoh's daughter finds Moses and she looks upon this little baby and she says, this is a child of the Hebrews. Clear distinction between the Egyptian people and the Hebrew people. And she was fond of this child and she raised the child, Moses, right? And then the first time we see Moses as, a, as an adult coming out, he goes out and he sees an Egyptian smiting the people that are there that are being held captive, which are his brethren, the Hebrew people. It says he saw an Egyptian smiting his brethren. He looks left, he looks right, he slays the Egyptian, buries his body in the sand, and does Yahweh charge him for unaliving someone? No. Did Yahweh charge Pinyas with unaliving someone? No. Because the Torah is specifically speaking to those who are of Israel, your neighbor. And yes, we can get into the sojourners. That's fine. That's totally fine by me. But you cannot get around the prophecies of Yahweh saying, in the end days, you can look at this in Zephaniah, you can look at this in Jeremiah, you can look at this in Isaiah. In that day, there will no longer be the Canaanite. In what day? The day when the Father's wrath comes upon the earth. Remember, uh, the seed of Abel is crying out his blood, because the Spirit lives in the blood. His blood is crying out, making suit against Cain, the Canaanites, until his seed is annihilated from the earth. How is his seed different than Abel's seed? Because if, if Cain and Abel are brothers and, the, and Cain's seed is going to be annihilated from the earth, that would mean Abel would be annihilated as well if he were actually blood, uh, blood brothers with Abel. But people don't want to look at this and say, yeah, this is what the scripture says. Instead, they want to change it. So what is he talking about with the spot? They have corrupted themselves in their spot. It is not the spot of his children. They are a perverse and crooked generation. 
Okay, so now let's go into, uh, I'm just gonna go into, do a simple word search, right? And we can read about the spots. Now, in Jeremiah 13, 23, it says, can the Ethiopian, the Cushite, the Canaanite, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may you also do good that are accustomed to do evil. If you read the entire the entirety of Jeremiah, uh, especially Jeremiah chapter 3, you're going to see that they were mixing seed and the father wasn't happy. They were playing the harlot. And un under every green tree, they had their skirts lifted up, remember? And then what happens? Same thing with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve are the first two created. Adam was red and ruddy. And then out of Adam, the rib in Hebrew, meaning his DNA, he created Eve. They weren't two different colored people in the garden. So explain to me where all of the other races of the earth come from. If that's just simple logic, if they're the first two created beings, where did the other races come from? It started in the garden, people, Genesis chapter 3. And it was going on outside of the garden in Genesis chapter 6. Who do you think was the leader of those watchers? Satan. But people just would much rather get along with all the people of the earth instead of just reading what the truth is. Yes, uh, Noah and his sons. One of Noah's sons was corrupted. Remember, Ham, uh, his son Canaan was cursed by Noah because of what Ham did to him because Ham became wicked. One of the daughters that were married, remember, the, the day that Noah's father dies and the day, this is the same day that he marries his uh, three boys, and they all enter the ark. Now, if you understand how the Nephilim worked, not all of uh, the Philistines were giants. Goliath was a giant, and there were many giants in the land. We know that they were fighting giants, but not all of them had that gene. It skips generations. So it's the same thing with the, the daughter of um, Ham being brought onto the ark. How do you think Ham became corrupted and wicked? Noah was perfect in his genealogies. Noah raised his children up in the way that they should go because he knew the Torah. So we see that after uh, Ham does what he does to Noah, Noah curses Canaan. Then we see Noah dividing up the land. The promised land is the land of Canaan. Some of the Canaanites stayed in that land, but some of them went the opposite direction, which are now proclaiming to be Israel. Israel is not the promised land according to scripture. It's called the land of Canaan, not Israel. All right, so also Song of Solomon. You can read all in the Song of, Song of Solomon. It's all through there. Um, I'll read a small, a small part of it. Song of Solomon, chapter 4, 6 through 8. Until the day break and the shadow flee away, I get me to the mountain of myrrh. And to the hill of frankincense, thou art fair. What does the word fair mean in Hebrew? Look that up. Thou art fair, my love, and there is no spot in thee. What does he mean? What is Solomon talking about? There's no spot in thee. And what does fair mean? Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse. With me from Lebanon. Look from top of Amana, from the top of Shinar and Hermon and the lion's dens from the mountains of the leopards. Who are the leopards? We just read about this. Can an Ethiopian change his skin? No. All right, so back to Deuteronomy 32. Verse five, they have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. They are a perverse and crooked generation. Verse six, do you thus requite Yahweh, O foolish people and unwise? Is not he thy father that have bought thee? Hath he not made thee and established thee? Keep this in mind as we go forth because it's going to tell you exactly who he's talking about. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father and he will show thee. Thy elders and they will tell thee. So all of the people that are forsaking the prophets in the Old Testament, you're forsaking knowledge and wisdom and understanding of what the Father loves and what the Father hates. Keeping all of the law, not making up your own doctrine and saying, oh, we're only going to keep the Ten Commandments. That's man-made BS. Verse 8, 
When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam. Did you catch what I just read? When he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. Who is he speaking about? The children of Israel. Verse 9. For Yahweh's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. So he's talking about Israel. Who was Jacob renamed? After he wrestled with an angel of the Most High. And the place that he wrestled was called Phanuel, not Peniel. The reason it was called Phanuel was because that's the name of our Messiah before he took on flesh. Again, I have this on my page. You guys can go look this up. I've got screenshots of all of this stuff and I've done many teachings on this. You can look this stuff up for yourself. Do not believe that the Roman Catholic Church, the people that are involved in writing and changing and altering all the words of the book, that put books in and then take books out. They take the name of the Father and remove that. They take the, num the name of the Son, remove that. And then they put their own stuff in there. They, re they replace the name of Yahweh and Yeshua with Lord and God. That's not the name. And sometimes it's uppercased L-O-R-D and other times it's lowercase L-O-R-D. Guess what? There was no punctuation in the original grammar or the original text. So when I hear people say, but it's in the red letters, there were no red letters, people. There was the Hebrew and there was the Greek. And the, the original language, which will be restored to us, is the Hebrew language. We see that all throughout the prophecies. It's the language that Abraham was given. Abraham didn't speak with the Hebrew tongue. The Messiah gave him because the Messiah, or Yahweh instructed the Messiah to give him the tongue of Hebrew so that he could transcribe the books. So all of the Greek where they take John 1.1 1, 1, and they say, um, uh, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. What is that word, W-O-R-D, word, what does that mean in Hebrew? It means Torah, teachings, way, instructions. So we go from the Hebrew language into the Greek and now all of a sudden that word means something different. Now it means Jesus is God. Instead of going back to the original language, which was the language that Yahweh intended for his people, it was never intended to be written in Greek. So, verse 9, for, the lot, for, for Yahweh's portion is his people, Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in a waste, howling wilderness, and he led him about. How did he lead him about? The Messiah. Remember, it tells us, that they were led by the hand of an angel, even those who were in the wilderness, always by the hand of an angel. Exodus 23, 20 through 27. As a matter of fact, let's go read that really quickly. Exodus 23, and I'll start in verse 20. This is Yahweh speaking through an angel. To Moses, he says, Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him. Who is Yahweh telling Moses to beware of? The angel that he's sending before him. Behold, I send an angel before you. Beware of him. Obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. In who? The angel. The Father is saying that his name is in this angel. What did the Messiah say? I have come in my Father's name and you receive me not. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. Okay, now watch this. He says, beware of this angel. Obey his voice. How are they going to obey his voice? Listen very closely. Verse 22. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak... Then I will be an enemy unto your enemies and an adversary unto your adversaries. So who are they? whose voice are they going to hear? They're going to hear Yahweh's instruction through this angel's voice. The angel is the mediator. That's what he just said. He said, beware of him, 
Obey his voice, provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions. Why? He wasn't sent to pardon our transgressions yet. He was leading the people. That's why the angels were created, to intercede for mankind. Then in verse 22, he says, But, Yahweh says, If you will indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak. How does Yahweh speak? Agency, through the angel. It makes no sense for him to say, Listen to the angel and do all that I speak. He's speaking through the angel. For my angel shall go before thee and bring thee unto the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. Question, did they obey his voice? No. Isaiah 63 clearly explains this. He was, this angel was turned against them to be their enemy because they did not obey the voice. All right, back to Deuteronomy 32. So he found, he, he's talking about Jacob. He found him in a desert land and in a waste howling wilderness and he led him about. He instructed him and he kept him as the apple of his eye. Who is the apple of Yahweh's eye? Is it not Israel? And can you look into a brother's eye and see that same thing that's being spoken of, the apple of the eye? You can see if someone has the light of the father in them or if they don't if they're lying or if they're not. This is what the apple of the eye is speaking of. Verse 11, As an eagle stirreth up her nest, and fluttereth over her young, and spreadeth abroad her wings, and taketh them, and beareth them on her wings, so Yahweh alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. So why was Jacob the one that Yahweh chose to have Jacob wrestle with the Messiah, Phanuel, and then he prevails. He didn't beat the angel. This is metaphorically speaking and spiritually speaking, uh, Israel or David was wrestling with the word of Yahweh. Same thing that we do, right? We have to, we have to prevail. We have to study to show ourselves approved and prevail and get victory with the word, in the word. This is the whole purpose of him wrestling with an angel. And people will say, well, it doesn't say, it said it was a man. Read the book of Hosea. The book of Hosea says that it was an angel that Jacob was wrestling with. How does a man touch the hollow of Jacob's thigh and dislocate it? It doesn't say he yanked on it or pulled on it. He said he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh and Jacob walked with a limp for the rest of his life. And then it says that he saw Yahweh face to face. Do a study on, on the Father being face to face. It always involves an angel being there. Manoah and his wife. Remember that story? Where they're, the Manoah, it's Numbers 13. Let me go there really quickly. They said the same thing. They, they were in fear that they saw the Father face to face. But what does Scripture say? No man has ever seen the Father at any time, nor heard his voice, nor seen his shape. Yet people will turn around and say, well, Moses saw him. No, Moses did not see him. If the Messiah says no man has ever seen him, then no man has ever seen him. And it's not just the Messiah that says it. Is it Numbers 13 or Numbers 12? Yeah. No, uh, wait, I'm thinking of the wrong book. This is, uh, this is about uh, Moses marrying the Ethiopian woman, which, by the way, somebody made a video on YouTube yesterday speaking about this. I'm going to read Numbers 12 so we can clarify what happened with uh, Miriam, Aaron, speaking against Moses. Numbers 12, and Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. Where do we find this information about who this Cushite woman was? Her name was Adoniah. She was the queen of the Cushites, right? Her father gave uh, Moses this woman to be a companion to him, right? In the book of Jasher, she stands up and she says, how long are you going to let this man, Moses, rule over us? He does not serve our gods, nor has he touched me or laid a hand on me. So right here we have Aaron and um, Miriam accusing Moses of breaking the Torah. This is what this whole commotion is about, okay? It's about the Ethiopian woman, Adoniah the queen. Verse 2, And they said, Hath Yahweh indeed spoken only by Moses? So now they're questioning Moses. 
Question, when Yahweh told Moses, you will be an Elohim to the people and Aaron will be your mouthpiece. The two prophets that he chose. And by the way, when it's talking about eagles' wings, it's talking about prophets. Okay? So he's saying, these two are saying, they're speaking against Moses and they're saying, has Yahweh only spoken by you, Moses? Hath not he spoken also by us? And Yahweh heard it. Now the man, Moses, was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. He was above every man on the face of the earth. And here his own brother and sister are accusing him of breaking the Torah. Verse 4, And Yahweh spake suddenly unto Moses and Aaron and Miriam and said, Come out, you three, unto, un, unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. And Yahweh came down in a pillar of a cloud. When the children of Israel were leaving Egypt, what was there? An angel. And what did Yahweh call it? A pillar of a cloud. Fire by night and a cloud by day. The Messiah. So Yahweh's coming down. Agencies being installed right here. And Yahweh came down in a pillar of a cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, Yahweh, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak to him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so. Who's Yahweh addressing here? Aaron and Miriam because of the Ethiopian woman. And what did Yahweh just say? If I, if I choose to speak to anybody, I will speak to them, a prophet. I will speak to them and make them known of me in a vision. And I will speak unto them in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all of my house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth even apparently, not in the dark speeches and the similitude of Yahweh, shall he behold. Wherefore then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of Yahweh was kindled against them, and he departed. And the pillar of the cloud departed from off of the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my master, not God, this is L-O-R-D, lowercase. We know this is agency in, in, in place here, and so did they. This is why they do this. Sometimes it's uppercase, sometimes it's lowercase. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my master, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us, whereon we have done foolishly. They've done foolishly, and they know it now. They just, Miriam just got slapped with leprosy, right? And wherein we have sinned. How did they sin? They're, they're, they're falsely accusing their own brother of breaking the Torah by mixing seed with another nation. Let her not become as one of the dead of whom the flesh hath consumed when it, as it comes out of her mother's womb. And Moses cried unto Yahweh saying, Heal her now, O Yahweh, I beseech thee. Moses is meek above all the men of the earth, correct? So he's praying for the very people that were just accusing him. And he's saying, Yahweh, heal her. Oh, oh, Yahweh, heal her now, I beseech thee. And Yahweh said unto Moses, listen to this. This is, Yahweh's not playing around, people. This is Yahweh's response. If her father had but spit in her face, should she not be ashamed for seven days? Let her be shut out from the camp for seven days and after that, let her be received in again. So do you think this is a polite way of speaking? He said, if her father had but spit in her face. What is he saying? She's lucky she didn't end up dead. That's what he's saying. She's lucky that she's only being pushed out of the camp for seven days. That's her punishment for speaking against Moses, the servant of Yahweh. And for those of you that are out there saying, well, Moses mixed seed, you better be very, very careful with what you're saying. Moses was a servant of the Most High. 
uh, I'm not, I was going to go to the story of uh, Manoah. Manoah and his wife, remember an angel comes down and Manoah's wife knows it's an angel, but Manoah doesn't. And then Manoah comes back and he realizes that there's a messenger there and he's instructing them. And Manoah says, um, let us prepare a meal for thee that when these sayings of yours come to, ma- come to pass, we may do thee honor. And the angel says to him, he says, if you're going to prepare, prepare a sacrifice, you must offer it unto the Father Yahweh, right? And then Manoah realizes that this is an angel because what happens to this man that's standing there before them? They start this uh, fire on the altar and the angel disappears and goes up in the fire of the flame of the altar and they say the same thing. We have seen the Father's face. Surely we're going to die. It was an angel. They didn't see the Father face to face. Yeah, the false accusa- accusations are never going to stop. It's all right. I mean, I know it. I know it's uh, prophesied in Scripture that these people are deaf. They can't hear, and all they're going to do is try to fight over it. But that's fine. I'm. I'm. My main concern, Nick, is for all of the people that are listening and hearing the truth. Many are called, but few choose to answer that call. And for those of you that have chosen to answer the call, I'm only here for you guys. I'm only trying to help edify you guys. And again, you don't need me to do this. You guys can go into the scripture and the Father will teach you and instruct you in his ways. But there is an order in which Yahweh spoke about. He said that he was going to wake up the battering rams from the promised land and that those battering rams were going to wake up the 144,000 and the 144,000 would wake up the remnant. That's the whole purpose of the 144,000. They've separated themselves from the world. They're not worried about going into churches and calling out pastors and all of that nonsense. They already know the fate of those pastors. The only people that are going to be woken up are those who the Father chooses to wake up. That's it. You can't wake them up. You can plant seed and some will come along and water that seed. And it's up to the person if they choose to push their pride aside. But it says a remnant will be saved. It doesn't say all of the churches and all the people that confess the name of Jesus and all this other stuff. Either we stick to what the prophecies say or we have nothing. All right. Verse 12. So Yahweh alone did lead him, speaking about Jacob, and there was no strange God with him. He made him to ride on the high places of the earth that he might eat the increase of the fields. Remember all of the blessings that come down when you're keeping the Father's commandments. He made him to suck the honey out of the rock. Who's the rock? And the oil out of the flinty rock. What's the oil? Honey? The Torah, sweet like honey on your lips, bitter when it goes into your stomach. The oil, remember the the ten virgins, five foolish, five wise. The five wise had their lamps trimmed with oil. The five foolish did not know the Torah. They weren't watching and waiting for all the signs that are given to us by the prophets so that those of us that are wise and awake will know when the Messiah returns. We'll know that when people are saying, oh, the Messiah is here, the Messiah is here, we're not going to fall for it. Because we know the Father has given us plenty of information about the signs of the times, how each seal is going to be opened, and how all the plagues are going to come. And when the seven trumpets are sounding, we're going to know, but the scripture tells us the rest of the world is going to be under such a strong delusion, they're not going to have a clue of the sign of the times. They're being placed under that because they've chosen to believe a lie. Verse 14. Butter of kine and milk of sheep, with fat of lambs and rams and the breed of Bashan and goats, with the fat of kidneys of wheat, and thou didst drink the pure blood of the grape. I hate this thing. Why do they do this every single time? All right, so remember the grape, guys? He said, and thou didst drink the pure blood of the grape. Remember in Isaiah chapter 5, where Yahweh sets up this vineyard? And the vineyard, he he pulls out all the stones, all all the other nations, all the things that are bad. And he makes this vineyard perfect. And he plants a vine. And the vine 
instead of bringing forth good grapes, it brings forth wild grapes, right? Mixture of seed again. Mixture of bad doctrine. The wine is how the... Uh, the grape is how they make the wine, correct? So you either got good and clean doctrine or you have bad doctrine. And it's saying that Jacob did drink the pure blood of the grape. He had the clarity of the Torah because he wrestled with the word and prevailed. Now he's got knowledge. Now he's able to walk out and instruct his 12 children. But they wind up disobeying. Yahweh cuts them off and says they're no longer his people. But then he promises in the very last days that a remnant, just as all throughout all the other prophets when the people would go in captivity, there was always a remnant left. So that the people that were willing to serve the Father weren't punished along with those who don't. The Father always provides a way out for his children. Verse 15, But Jeshurun wax, waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat, and thou art grown thick. Thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook Yahweh, which made him, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. Again, there's the rock. Yahweh is the rock of our salvation. And why does it say he's the rock of our salvation? What does salvation mean in Hebrew? Yeshua. He sent his son to bring everything back into right standing. Verse 16. Then provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to Yahweh, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that they came up newly up, whom your fathers feared not. What's happening today, people? You've got the younger generation being brainwashed by even the older generation, you've got news sources, media outlets, Hollywood, the music industry. You don't think all of these people are selling their souls and you don't, you don't see the people worshiping other people? Starstruck? These are fallen entities. Nothing new under the sun. Same thing they were doing back then. Same thing everybody's doing today. They're worshiping unto devils. People, I've, I've seen these, these guys that come onto my comments and say, Oh, you're not, you're not casting out demons. You're not doing any, any of these things in the churches like we are. There's books that make this very clear, that Satan uses this in the churches, right? Because Satan can't cast out Satan, but he can play games with people. He can have somebody, a demon, who's demon-possessed, having them shaking and screaming and yelling in the middle of the church service, and then everybody gets up and lays their hands on them thinking they're doing uh, something great by casting out demons, yet you never see anybody cast out a demon from someone and they stay normal. It's usually people that are, are messed up and they stay that way because they're, uh, they're oppressed or possessed by a demon, right? So Satan's doing this in the churches on purpose. And again, I'm not going to go into the books. Uh, it's in Ecclesiasticus. You can go read about it, but it's also in the Apocalypse of Elijah. It's all throughout the books, right, that Satan would use these tactics to fool the Christians, and the Father's allowing it because they don't know the truth. They don't realize the Father's face is turned away from us. That's the whole purpose of the second measure of the Spirit being poured out mid-tribulation is so that we can cast out demons, so that we can do signs, wonders, and miracles, so that we do have dreams and visions. That's the promise the Father made. Nothing more, nothing less. So don't be deceived by these churches that are growing people's legs out, which is a trick that they've been doing for years while they're asking you for tithe money. Verse 18. Uh, let me reread re verse 17. They sacrifice unto devils, not to Yahweh, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that they knew that came up newly, whom your fathers feared not. Of the rock, they begat thee. Thou art unmindful and has forgotten Yahweh that formed thee. Who's the rock? Who's our rock? Yahweh. Who's the Messiah's rock? Yahweh. And who is their rock? Satan. Remember, there's a good shepherd, the Messiah, and then there's an evil shepherd that scatters the flock, Satan. So you guys better know your shepherds. Because Satan mimics everything the Father does. So much so that before the Messiah returns, 
most people are going to fall for the trap. Most believers, 90 per, probably 99% of them, are going to fall right into the trap that the anti-Messiah has been laying for nearly 2,000 years now. Through the churches. And remember, this, the statue of Nebuchadnezzar, the ten-toed kingdom, that's Rome broken up all over the earth. Mystery Babylon. It's not just one place. It's multiple places. It's a spirit all through all these churches, and it's constantly shifting. And when, Yah and when Yahweh saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. What did he warn us about? Do not mix seed and do not allow your daughters to marry their sons and do not allow your, your sons to marry their daughters because they will pull you away to serve other gods. So what is he saying here? And, we, and when Yahweh saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. When does his face turn back to us? In the midst of our affliction, mid-tribulation, the indignation. Then he covers us, pours out his spirit upon those that are following him. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be. For they are a very forward generation, children in whom is no faith. They have moved me to jealousy, which that, with that which is not Yahweh. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. And I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. Is this racist? I will move them, who's them? His sons and his daughters, the remnant of Jacob. I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Who's this talking about? If people read the entire book, they would know exactly who this is talking about. It's those who are not going to enter the congregation of the Most High. And for the other nations that are not uh, entirely cut off, that can cleave to Israel, they have a choice when all of this starts. They can go against Israel, which many of them will, and there are many that are awake and realize, no, I'm not going to go against the Father's people. They'll be on the new earth. So for all you people that are saying we're racist, you better understand what we're saying before that comes out of your mouth. And if you're going to call me a racist, you better be prepared to call the Father a racist as well because it's written all throughout this book. The problem is the people that are saying that, they don't understand it. They don't see it. They, they can't even understand the law. They're telling you only keep the Ten Commandments. That's it, in the, food, in the food laws. So now I guess it's okay for us to do whatever we want. A man can sleep with a beast, or a man can uh, dress up in a woman's garment, or he can go uh, commit adultery on his wife, or he can uh, eat swine now, right? Or he can do whatever, ever, whatever, opposite of the, the law, what the law states. He can mix seed with other nations. That's been done away with. No. It's all of the law and all of the prophets. Not the sacrificial law that was added as a punishment. You can place yourself back under that divorce decree by not keeping the law, statutes, and commandments. That's the divorce letter that was nailed to the pole that the Messiah was crucified on. He did away with the sacrificial law. But you can place yourself back under it. It's not us doing it. We're warning you not to go back under it. Read Deuteronomy 28 and understand what it's saying. And then read the rest of the book. Throughout all of the prophets, all the way through the New Testament, everybody that kept the commandments were blessed. Those that didn't died a horrible death. As instructed in Deuteronomy 28, 16 through 67, all of the curses that will fall upon you for not keeping the laws. I will heap mischiefs upon them, and I will spend my arrows upon them. Now, again, a simple word search for arrows will tell you a lot about who Yahweh's arrows are, which are the other nations. So he's talking about the children of Jacob that have turned away, correct? Let's see. Let me get into...
All right, I'm going to read Isaiah 7, 23 through 25. And it shall come to pass in that day that every place shall, shall be where there will be a thousand vines and a thousand silverlings. It shall even be for briars and thorns, the offspring of the Canaanites or the offspring of the fallen. With arrows and with bows shall men come thither, because all the land shall become briars and thorns. And on all the hills shall be digged with the mattock. There shall not come thither the fear of briars and thorns, but it shall be for the sending forth of the oxen and the treading of the lesser cattle. Blood up to the horse's bridle, people. Again, we could go all, I could teach all day long on just the arrows alone. Jeremiah chapter 51, starting in verse 10. Yahweh hath brought forth our righteousness. Come and let us declare in Zion the work of Yahweh our Elohim. Make bright the arrows, gather the shields. Yahweh hath raised up the spirit of the kings of the Medes. For the device is against Babylon to destroy it because... It is the vengeance of Yahweh, the vengeance of his temple. Set up the standard upon the walls of Babylon and make watch, make the watch strong. Set up the watchmen, prepare the ambushes. For Yahweh hath both devised and done that which he had spake against the inhabitants of Babylon. Question, where are we now? Babylon. Uh, Lamentations 3.13, he hath caused the arrows of his quiver to enter into my reins. What does the word reins mean? Kidneys. Ezekiel chapter 5.16, when I shall send upon them the evil arrows of famine, which shall be for their destruction, in which I shall send to destroy you, and I will increase the famine upon you, and I will break the staff of bread. We could, again, I could go through every single prophet and show you what the arrows are talking about in Deuteronomy 32, the song of Moses, the song that the 144,000 will be singing. But there's very few people that I've seen that can go through this and read it and actually understand what it's saying. Verse 23, I will heap mischiefs upon them and I will spend my arrows upon them. Other nations are going to come in and destroy all of Israel. Why? Because we don't want to be obedient to the Father's commandments and his laws, and his statutes. Instead, we want to live with one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom, and it doesn't work that way. Now listen to what verse 24 says. They shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat and with the bitter destruction. I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them with the poison of the serpents of the dust. Now, we've gone through this before. Who were the beasts? The Canaanites and all of the fallen. They were called beasts in the Old Testament. They were called animals. They were considered to be wild animals because of their behavior, the way that they act. They destroy everything. They can't even get along with their own kind. So he's going to send the teeth of beast upon them with the poison of the serpents of the dust. Going back to Genesis chapter 3, what was Satan's punishment? You shall go on your belly all the days of your life and lick up the dust. When we did our study on dust, what was dust? Death. It wasn't a serpent. He wasn't a snake. It's a name. It's a name that's given to him. Revelation 12, Satan, that old serpent, the devil, Revelation 20, same exact thing. That old serpent, the devil, and Satan. <laughs> yep, exactly, Michael. I will also send the teeth of beast upon them with the poison of the serpents of the dust. This is also speaking about uh, Revelation chapter 9, the locust army. Verse 25, the sword without and terror within shall destroy both the young man and the virgin, the suckling also with the man of gray hairs. Who's going to do this? The locust army, Joel chapter 2, Revelation chapter 9, the other nations that are coming in 
to your country. They're already here. People want to side with them. Wait till you go out there and start trying to side with them and they start gaining more and more power. Wait till election is over. From November 5th all the way up to January 1st. Watch what happens during that time period. Do not think for one second that things are going to get better. They're not. These are the signs of the times that the Father warned us about with all of the prophets that he sent. Over a hundred prophets. And what did the people do? They unalived every single one of them. And they said, no, we will not listen to your word, Father. We will do, we will worship gods and we will play the harlot and we will do what is right in our own eyes. And then when they get punished, then they start begging for forgiveness. And it's too late by that point. People, you have to get it together now or you're not going to make it through what's coming. We're already seeing every single European nation has been taken over and we're seeing the mass destruction of just the anger of the earth which lays accusation against us. Remember, sin entered, to, in, in, entered into the land, the earth, not us. If you start allowing Satan to manipulate you, yes, you can be possessed by demons. But sin entered into the land. And when men sin in the land that the Father gives you, it becomes corrupt and men's hearts become evil continually. Just like in the days of Noah, Matthew chapter 24, the Messiah said it would be just as in the days of Noah. The days of Noah, what were they doing? Manipulating DNA. The Nephilim were going into the son, the daughters of men, creating giants. They were mixing animals, right? Crossbreeding animals, mixing the DNA of animals, birds, and beasts, and drinking the blood. Where does the spirit live according to scripture? In the blood. So why do you think these people like to drink blood so much? Verse 25 again, the sword without and terror within shall destroy both the young man and the virgin and the suckling also with the man of gray hairs. What does it say about the locust army? That they will have no pity on a child, on a woman, or on an old man or an old woman. They will not care about gold or silver. Their eye will be evil upon you and they will take everything that you have. That's in Deuteronomy 28, the curses of not keeping the law. He says he's going to send these evil beasts in and they're going to rob you of your children. They're going to take your homes. They're going to take your wives. They're going to dash your children into pieces. They're going to ravage the women. Every single prophecy, people, not just some of them, all of them. So if you, if you want to argue, go argue with the Father. This is the song of Moses that we were just reading in Revelation chapter 15. This is the song that they're singing. They're warning the people. For all the self-proclaimed watchmen out there, you guys have no idea what this is talking about. You don't get to pick and choose who a watchman is. You don't get to say, oh, we're all watchmen. No. The Father chooses those people. And if you're not awake and not instructed in the law, the prophets, the Psalms, and then the fulfillment of those things in the New Testament, you have no business teaching anybody anything. All you guys are doing is leading people into a ditch with you. It's the blind leading the blind. Verse 26, I said I would scatter them into the corners. Were we scattered? Yes. That's the whole purpose of the Messiah coming back to gather. It's the whole purpose of 144 to round up the remnant, to bring them back into the promised land. The only land that will not experience everything that's coming upon the earth. So if you're not part of the remnant and you think, like I said before, you're going to stay here and you're going to ride it out, good luck. Guarantee you everything that the Father said would happen to you if you're part of that is going to happen. You cannot change prophecy. I said I would scatter them into the corners and I would make the remembrance of them to cease from among men. Were it not that I feared the wrath of the enemy, lest their adversaries should behave themselves strangely, and lest they should say, Our hand is high, and Yahweh hath not done all of this. For they are a nation void of counsel, neither is there any understanding in them. So, just a question. Who are the people that you have seen speaking 
the truth and understanding and being able to break this down line for line, word for word, and show you what this means. Who is the father talking about? Who's the nation that's void of counsel that doesn't have any understanding in them? That are wearing strange apparel, screaming into microphones, telling you you're going to be their servants on the new earth. Think long and hard. And don't let your, 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 your love for people get in the way because the Father promises that he's going to show you. It doesn't matter how you feel about it. He's going to show you that when the time comes that the people that you think you can trust, I know I've worked in a prison. I know how it works. I've seen it myself. And if, when, when you're in a prison and you're a prisoner and you go in as a prisoner, jails and prisons are different. If you go into a prison, you have to click up. You have to go into with your own people, your own kind. Why do you think segregation existed? Why do you think it was illegal for a white man to marry a black woman here in the United States? A hundred years ago, it was illegal. The basic foundings and principles were established to a certain degree upon this book. But it's now become modern-day Egypt. It's written all over the place. It's, it's in the music. It's in Hollywood. It's on your dollar bill. The spirit of Egypt is here. It's America. Why do you think they do all of this and put out their tongue, the all-mocking tongue, the vow of silence? Better wake up. This is not, this is not a new teaching. This is stuff, like Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. This is all stuff that was happening in Egypt, in Babylon. So he's going to make us jealous with a people that is not a people. And then he says, for they are a nation void of counsel, meaning they have no understanding. They don't have the father's counsel. Neither is there any understanding in them. Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. Why is he saying, oh, that they were wise? That they would consider their latter end. Because they wouldn't go up against Israel. But they have to, because Israel is disobedient. Verse 30. How should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight, except their rock had sold them, and Yahweh had shut them up? Second measure of the Spirit gets poured out, and then what happens? Mid-tribulation, once we have the second measure of the Spirit, the roles reverse. We're going to be worn out and torn up by the time mid-tribulation comes. Then the Father pours His Spirit out, and then what does it say? This is not just in Deuteronomy 32, right? It says, um, how should one chase a thousand? This is, this is part of the prophecies. When the second measure of the Spirit is poured out, one man will put a thousand to flight and two men together will put 10,000 to flight. Not my opinion. This is why the song of Moses is so important. Verse 31, for their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is the vine of Sodom, and of the fields of Gomorrah, their grapes are the grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Remember, there's two vines as well. There's two shepherds. There's two vines. There's two grapes. The Messiah said, I am the vine. You are the branches. What's being said here? For their vine, Satan, is the vine of Sodom. And their fields of Gomorrah, their grapes are the grapes of gall. You know what gall is? It's what they gave our Messiah on that pole. It's the sponges that the Romans would use. They would take a sponge, put it on a stick, and this is how people would wipe their bottoms. This is how public restrooms were set up. And they would put vinegar in there and dip it in the vinegar. This is what they put up to our Messiah's mouth when they were crucifying him. And no, the Messiah did not say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. How do we know that? We go back into the prophets and we read what the prophets say about it. The book of Psalms, chapter 69, the Messiah says, Blot them out of the book of the living. Add iniquity unto their iniquity. 
allow their backs to be bent backwards, darken their eyes so that they cannot see. You don't think the Messiah knew who was trying to crucify him? It was the Jews of that time. Same thing's happening right now. Esau selling out Jacob. All the mighty merchants of the earth, they're selling the rest of us out for money, for gain, for, for material possessions, not realizing that once they do that, these other nations are going to destroy them. And any that's left, the Messiah is going to destroy, which is the one chapter of Obadiah. Esau, Yahweh says he hated so question for everybody that denies the serpent seed doctrine. Can Esau enter to the congregation of the Most High? Can a Canaanite enter the congregation of the Most High? Can any of the fallen enter the congregation of the Most High? There were giants before the flood and also after the flood. Did they disappear? Did all the nations that existed back at that time just fall off the face of the planet and then all of a sudden new people sprouted up? No, we're still walking the earth today. Every single nation is still walking the earth today. And people say, well, that was for the Jews back then. No, 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 no. You don't realize who you are. And if you are part of Israel, you can trace your lineage back to the tribe that you're from. But there's only one nation on the face of this planet that can do it. Uh, their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. Okay, so their vine is the vine of Sodom, and their wine, their doctrine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of, cruel venom of asps. Is it not laid up in store with me and sealed amongst my treasures? Meaning, this is not going to change. If the Father says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. We're Deuteronomy 32, 35. To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand. And the things that should come upon them make haste. For Yahweh shall judge his people. Remember, correction starts at the house of the Father first. Ezekiel chapter 9. For Yahweh shall judge his people and repent himself. For his servants, when he seeth that their power is gone, and there is none shut up or left. And he shall say, Where are their gods, their rock, in whom they trusted? Two different rocks. You are not a prophet, an authorized teacher. Who, who says who is authorized to teach? The Roman Catholic Church? Do you have to go get an indoctrination from them? Foolish people, man. Verse 38. Which did eat of the fat of their sacrifices and drank of the wine of their drink offerings. Let them rise up and help you and be your protection. Two rocks. Choose which one you want to be. And again, guys, I only address that because I want Satan to know that I don't care what he thinks. I, I could care less what Satan thinks, but I want him to know that I'm never going to stop singing this song. Verse 39, see now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I unalive, and I make alive. I wound, and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. Who's the Father's hand? The Messiah. For I lift up my hand to heaven, and I say, I live forever. I wet my glittering sword. Who's his sword? Who's, what's the Messiah called? The word of God. So he's saying, I wet my glittering sword with blood and my hand take hold on judgment. The sword, the word, the Messiah. I will render vengeance to my enemies and I will reward them that hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with the blood, and my sword shall devour flesh, and that with the blood of the slain and of the captives from the beginning of the revengeance upon the enemy. 
Now there's a lot in this. I, I want to point a couple things out. This glittering sword, it's spoken about Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. He talks about when he pulls his sword out of his sheath, that he's go it's going to be a bloodbath, especially in Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 30 through 40 explains all the destructions of all the nations. That includes Israel, those that are disobedient. Every nation is going to be at the mercy of the sword of the Most High. And this sword, when the Messiah is returning in Revelation 19, it says he has many crowns upon his head. It's because he's returning with the 144,000 and all the armies of heaven, the angels. All right, verse 43. <clears throat> Rejoice, all you nations, with his people. So for those of you that are wondering, are we allowed to be part of Israel? Listen. Rejoice, O you nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants, and he will render vengeance on his adversaries, and will be merciful unto his land and to his people. If you choose to take up the covenants and serve the Father, you have nothing to fear. But the problem is, we know only a remnant is going to be saved. Out of 8 billion people, it's not many. Verse 44, And Moses came and spake all the words of this song in the ears of the people, he and Hosea, the son of Nun. And Moses made an end of speaking all these words to all of Israel. And he said unto them, Set your hearts unto all the words which I testify among you this day which you shall command your children to observe, to do all the words of this law. Not some of the law that you people want to pick out. I'm not talking about the people in here. The people that know what I'm talking about, I'm sure they're either outside hiding or they're inside. And if they are inside, that's fine. Listen closely. Command your children to observe, to do all the words of this law. For it is not a vain thing for you because it is your life. And through this thing, you shall prolong your days in the land, whither you go over Jordan to possess it. And Yahweh spake unto Moses the selfsame day, saying, Get thee up into this mountain, uh, Abram, unto the Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, that is over against Jericho. And behold, the land of Canaan, not the land of Israel, the land of Canaan, which I gave unto the children of Israel for a possession. And die in the mount whither thou goest up, and be gathered unto thy people as Aaron thy brother died in Mount Hor, and was gathered unto his people. Because you trespassed against me, and all the children of Israel at the waters of, at Merikabesh in the wilderness of Zin, because you... Uh, I lost my place. Because you sanctified me not in the midst of the children of Israel, yet thou shalt see the land before thee, but thou shalt not go thither unto the land which I gave to the children of Israel. Why? Why is the Father not allowing them to go into the land? Hebrews chapter 3. I mean, it's, it's, it's explained all through this book alone. They were disobedient. They had an evil heart of unbelief. They didn't keep the law, statutes, and commandments. And they had no faith. When the father said, go in and unalive man, woman, child, and beast, he wasn't talking about unaliving innocent people. They were the fallen. That's why he flooded the earth. When people say, I couldn't serve a God who flooded all these innocent people, they weren't innocent. It says their hearts were evil continually. They were not created by the father. The Messiah said, every tree that my heavenly father did not plant, I will root up and cast into the fire. Meaning, Genesis chapter 3 and Genesis chapter 6 are true. That the sons of God, the Ben Elohim, went into the daughters of men and bore the Nephil, the first race of the giants, which were way taller than the cedar trees that we read about here in the 66 book canon way taller, and so were the trees way taller. Remember, Adam lived 930 years. There are giants walking the earth today, and if they lived a thousand years and the trees 
were as big as they were back then. Remember in the book of Daniel, the angels were told to come down and hew the trees down so that the Nephilim couldn't get to the top of the trees to survive the flood. So you can go against this all you want, but it's written in every single book. Every time the people were transgressing and playing the harlot, they were mixing seed with other nations. Is as it's written in the law. It's not allowed. And when he's talking about that in the law, about not planting seed amongst other seed, he wasn't talking about a field. He's talking about flesh. Now, let's go back to Adam being red and ruddy, one who can blush and show blood under the skin. In Jeremiah chapter 6, or sorry, chapter 8, when he's talking about the children that had mixed seed, and then they have children which are of other ethnicities at that point, what does scripture call them? Bastards. Look up the definition for yourself. And then what did he say about them? Were these people ashamed when they had committed this abomination? Nay. They were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. Why would he say that? Twice in the book of Jeremiah alone. What does Lebanon mean? What about Laban that Abraham instructed Isaac and Jacob to marry back into his own family line? Laban, L-A-B-A-N. Strong's number 3637. White ones. Don't like what I'm saying? I don't care. The people that are proclaiming to be something they're not, Revelation 2.9, Revelation 3.9, are the people that are controlling this entire earth. It's Esau. Jacob and Esau were born of Isaac and Rebekah. If Isaac and Rebekah married, or were come, they came from Laban, if they were both of the same bloodline, then there's no way that Isaac and Rebekah gave birth to two children that were two different races, people. That's just complete. Uh, let me not even say the word. It's, it, it blows my mind that you people that are denying this think that Isaac and Rebecca gave birth to one child that was white and one child that was black. Because when I hear the BHI movement saying, oh, all the white people, you guys are Esau. Esau became the father of the Edomites because he married two Hittite women. Who are the Hittite women? Descendants of the Canaanites. So let's make sure we understand what we're talking about when Rebecca goes and says, if this be so, Father, why are these children fighting in my womb? And the father says, two nations are in thy womb. And what does BHI do? They run with it. And they say, see, you guys, you guys are Esau and we're Jacob. If I, if I have a child with someone of my own race, am I going to have a black child and a white child? Or do you people not understand prophecy? Because if you read all of the genealogies, if you read Esau's genealogy, it tells you in the very last verse of his genealogy, number one, they, they were all dukes. So look up that word and understand what that means. But the very last verse says that Esau became the father of the Edomites. Going back to Abraham, remember, Abraham uh, and Sarah. Sarah's womb was closed, and Sarah tells Abraham to go into Hagar. They were, they were being impatient. They weren't waiting on the father. But it was still part of the father's plan, because he goes into Hagar, and Ishmael is born. Ishmael and Hagar were both children of Israel. Hagar was from the land of Egypt. Now, what happens later on? Ishmael goes back to Egypt, his mother's homeland. Just like when someone is born, we're scattered in every nation. So if you're born in America, you're called an American, regardless of what color your flesh is. So think about that with Abraham and Ishmael, right? Ishmael was Abraham's firstborn son. That's who all the all of the uh the father's possessions and all of the stuff that the father has, he gives to his firstborn son. But many times in scripture, we see the firstborn doesn't get it. Same thing with Jacob and Esau. And there's a reason why Esau sold his birthright. He didn't care about his birthright. He wasn't following the father. 
He didn't just sell his birthright over a bowl of food because he was hungry one day. He chopped Nimrod's head off and the whole army of Nimrod was chasing him. And he said, give me some of those lentils that you've made. I'm starving. I'm, I'm being chased down by Nimrod. And he said, what is, this, what is this to me? I don't care about this. He had no interest in serving the father. And then what did he do? They cut off Jacob and all of Jacob's people and rejoiced over their death. And then later on, Jacob unalives his brother. Same thing's going to happen. Nothing new under the sun. Same stories. People better get this right and stop arguing with those of us that have studied out all of these genealogies and bloodlines. I don't think there's any person, even the scholars and even the people that know this book very well, they know that the Muslim race came from Ishmael's bloodline, people. Why do you think the Muslim race, they serve Allah, and the Christians, or the people that say they believe in this book, are always up against those two? It's always between those two races. Who do you think these people, the Philistines that are coming in with their flags all over your country, what God do they serve? In the Middle Eastern area, what God do they all serve? It's Allah. So when Shahira law becomes law of the land, scripture tells you that people's heads are going to be lopped off. Does it not? Does scripture not say people are going to be beheaded? Who does beheadings? Think about the people that are in office. I can tell you this, nothing against the women, but if a woman president takes over America, you, you can guarantee it's going to go down. You, 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 I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna go into that too deeply because I don't want this teaching to be taken down, but I'm just gonna warn you guys right now. We already know what's coming is a no-win situation. It doesn't matter who's elected. It's going to be bad either way. People are fed up with the last, I don't know, four, longer, longer than four years, but we did, we did have a little reprieve. But people think that voting for Donald Trump, I see believers on here saying, if you don't vote for Trump, you're not a Christian. Well, I'm not a Christian anyways. I'm a believer. I'm a follower of the way, as, as Paul said he was in Acts 24, 14. That's what people are. People were called in this book, followers of the way. They weren't called Christians. Christianity was made up and came in a long time after, and the coin Christian was coined in Antioch to mock the believer. And if you look up the word Christian, it means earth pig. And what's the abomination that the Father hates? Those that eat the swine's flesh. Isaiah 65 and 66. It's made very clear. Those, when he returns, that are caught hiding behind the tree in the midst, eating the swine's flesh and the rat and the mouse and the abominable thing will be destroyed. Have you seen what they're cooking on the streets of New York? Oh yeah, big old giant sewer rats. So you guys can believe what you want to believe, but understand one thing at the end of this, Moses is told to go up and, and die as Aaron died to go to be with his people, right? Moses had a special covenant with the father. I hear people saying, oh, Moses disobeyed the father and the father was angry with him and that's why he couldn't enter the land. No, he had a much better promise. He went to paradise people. Moses and many other people were taken into paradise. Enoch, Elijah, Moses, all of the greats that followed the father. That's why paradise was preserved for them up there. You have Abraham's bosom, right? Where the Messiah freed all of those that were captive by Satan and put them into that one chamber in Sheol, the four chambers, the four heart, the four chambers of the heart of the earth. That's where the Messiah went. He went and ministered to the saints. He wasn't down there ministering to the fallen angels. Their, their fate is sealed. They cannot return to their first estate. Scripture tells us in the New Testament, if the father spared not his angels, his sons, how much greater of a punishment suppose is going to happen to us that know this and disobey him anyways? The entire chapter of Jude is not that long. Read it and understand who it's talking about. It's talking about these very people that are cut off. Clouds without water. Trees that are dried up. 
twice plucked up and dead, feasting with you, taking as much as they can. They can never get enough. Let me explain something to you very quickly before I end this, because I do have to go get my son. All of these people, don't think it's a coincidence that sports, if you look at sports, who's the majority of people that are athletic? You, you don't have to type it in here. Just think for, for one second. Who's the majority of the people that are athletic and who's the majority of the people that run the, the music industry? Now, when those people, those actors, those artists, which are also Esau, they're also the Canaanite, when they start cutting those people off, which is what prophecy says is going to happen, these people like uh, the one that just got locked up, the rapper, I'm not going to say his name. You guys can type it out if you want to. These people that are billionaires that are losing everything, do you think they're going to just let this slide? Think about when everybody starts losing the way of life that they're so used to that they've sold their, soul, their souls for. Do you think that that's going to go over well, especially with everything else that's happening? Not just the weather. I'm talking about the punishment of not keeping the law, all of the curses. When people start losing their homes and their families, which is already starting to happen, the father is going to separate those. Remember, he said, I will take one of a house and two of a city. So think about all the cities and all the houses. He will take one of a house and two of a city. Those will be the ones that will be saved. That's not very many. Out of 8 billion people, it's not many. It's a very small group. And it's those that have given up everything of this world. They place nothing before the Father. And their sole purpose is to make sure that they're waking people up. And again, when I say waking people up, it's not us that does that. It's the, all the glory goes to the Father. But when you're preaching what the prophets taught and you're bringing this new song, which is not a new song, it's written in the book of Deuteronomy. The second book in the Bible, the song of Moses, in Revelation chapter 15, what are they singing? Let's read it again. Verse 3. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of Yahweh, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Yahweh Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Doesn't get any clearer than that, guys. And again... I understand a lot of people struggle with Revelation. A lot of people struggle with Daniel. Daniel is a very complex book. And, and trying to get the timelines down. Understand this when I say this. The time of Jacob's trouble is not tribulation. The time of Jacob's trouble is leading up to tribulation. Jacob's trouble ends when tribulation begins. The time of Jacob's trouble, which is spoken, which was, which is spoken about throughout the prophets. And people will argue with me about this all the time. I will do an entire teaching on that alone. And we'll cover, um, maybe if Michael's interested, because he just went through it as well. Maybe we'll cover the book of Daniel, and then we'll show you through the prophecy how to properly read the book of Revelation. You cannot just pick up the book of Revelation and read through it and expect you're going to understand anything that's happening. Some of it's made pretty clear. We know Satan's going to be bound in a bottomless pit. He's going to be chained up. He's going to be let loose after the thousand year reign, but there's a lot of prophetical speech in here, a lot of parables, if I can put it that way, that are not easy to understand. And I get that. And I understand that people struggle with it. But the main reason why I don't just go in and break all of this stuff down, even Deuteronomy 32, we could spend all day on that and cross-reference scriptures everywhere. I want you guys to go do that. I want you guys to go look up those key words that I was pointing out. The arrows, the dew, the sword, the nations, the foolish nation with no understanding. Study to show yourself approved and allow it to become your own revelation. That way nobody will ever be able to move you off of the rock. This is why it says that these other people that are on here, these people are swayed by every wind of doctrine that comes along. And some are becoming so discouraged because they don't know what to believe. What did the Messiah say? He told us to go directly to the Father, not to listen to other men. It's okay if you have a, a person that you like to listen to, but don't believe a word that I say. Don't believe a word that Michael says. Don't believe a word that Jason says. We're just men. 
go and read it for yourself. Just know that everything that we teach, we don't just come on here and teach willy-nilly. We have plenty of witnesses, and that's how you establish a matter in Scripture, upon two or more witnesses, right? And there's a way to do that when there's conflict. Out of the mouth of two or more witnesses shall a matter, a matter be established. And normally it's 10, 15, 20, even 30 witnesses just on one verse that you can cross-reference. The cross-references are amazing, but that's how you find truth. That's how we know the Messiah didn't say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. The people that did that to the, the Most High Son are not going to get away with it. The people that are doing it to his children today are not going to get away with it. The people that are living right now, the people, you need to understand this. For the men that are teachers, if you're teaching right now and you're prophesying the words of the prophets, you're fulfilling the end of this book. What the prophet saw and wrote about was us. We're living in that time. So you better answer the call. Consider the call. I've said this to many people. Consider the call. Don't allow fear and other things to stand in your way of speaking truth. The father said, if you're ashamed of me, or the son said, if you're ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of you. And the father will reject you because of it. So don't be afraid. Don't fear men. Remember, when, when the Most High would send the, the prophets in, he would say, I'm sending you into a, a stiff-necked, stubborn, hard-headed people. Do not fear them. And they would go in and speak the words and do all the crazy stuff that they were told to do. Every one of them. And guess what? They all were unalived. And the same thing goes with uh, the apostles. Remember, the apostles walked with the Messiah, and then the Messiah woke them up. And then what happened? They, every one of them, with the exception of one, which was John, had to be left so he could write the book of Revelation. All of them died in terrible, terrible ways. One was sawed in half. One was boiled. John, John that wrote the book of Revelation, he was boiled. One was thrown from a building and was burst asunder. Some of them were ripped into pieces and had their insides pulled out. They saw and believed something. I don't think people would just go out that way if they didn't truly believe in what they witnessed. And remember, Peter denied the Messiah before he was crucified three times. The one that said, I'll die with you. And it's not that Peter was afraid. Remember Malachi the soldier, or not Malachi, Mal Malachus, Malchus, Malchus. Malchus the Roman soldier, when they came to arrest the Messiah, Peter pulled out his sword and took that guy's ear clean off. And the Messiah didn't say a word. He reached down, he picked up the ear, put it back on the soldier's head, and he turned around and told Peter, Peter, what are you doing? Do you not know that those that live by the sword shall die by the sword? He didn't say a word to the soldier. Even while they're coming and beating him, and he's, he's in chains, they're whipping him and beating him, he's still loving enough to bend down and put someone's ear back on. He was always working. For those of us that know what the scripture means when it's coming to Shabbat and keeping the Sabbath day holy, that's something you better be doing. It's an everlasting perpetual covenant. If you want your knowledge and understanding to increase, when the sun sets on Friday, you better be in your scriptures you better be spending time with the Father until the sun sets on Saturday. But many won't do it because they want their Friday night and their Saturday night because they're out in Babylon working. I get it. But if you think watching sports and watching movies and doing all of this other stuff is more important than keeping the Father's set-apart day, it, we're going to be keeping it on the new earth as well. And then we won't have this stupid argument about, well, we're, we're children of the day, not children of the night. Sabbath is morning from morning. So you mean when the sun goes down, you're, you're, you're just a filthy sinner? These are things that people are saying and they don't have any understanding. You can't keep the Sabbath every day. Listen, guys, the Sabbath was a set-apart day. If you're doing it every day, then that means you are not working. The whole purpose that Yahweh designed man was to work for six days and on the seventh day to rest. 
For those of you that say, well, the Messiah is my rest. Why? Because the Messiah said, I am the master of the Sabbath? Because he had the key of David? Many of you guys don't even know what this means and you say you're resting every day. And maybe you just meant maybe you're studying every day. That's fantastic if that's what you meant. But the Messiah is not your Sabbath day rest, people. It's the Father's set apart day. If you're not keeping it, guess what? Even the angels in heaven keep it. The Father keeps it. Friday, sundown. Saturday, sundown. Yes. And when you're keeping this Shabbat, you're not to cause others to work. You're not to go out and buy anything. If you're buying stuff, other people are working, right? You're not to be doing any type of work on the Sabbath day. It's a day of rest. You prepare all of your meals on Friday, the day prior. Get everything ready that you need ready so that there's no work involved. It's a day of rest. You can go into these books. Just study the laws. You'll, you'll read about the Shabbat. You can start understanding these things. I can promise you this. For those of you that deny it, if you will just try, give it some time. Don't think you're going to just keep the Sabbath day one day. Don't test the Father like that. Do it with good intentions. Go into keeping the Sabbath day and go in and study and watch your mind be blown by what the Father will open up and show you. I've been experiencing it for years now, and I never knew. I always thought Sunday was a day of worship. I was indoctrinated by the Christian church for a very, very long time. And I've seen all of the nonsense that goes on in those churches. So I'm warning people, be careful by profaning the Sabbath. You cannot, for, for the people that don't know this, the feast days were removed from us. It's written in these books. It's written in Lamentations. It's written in Jubilees. It's written all over the place. The Father took the feast days away from us. It was prophesied that it was going to happen in the last days. If you're, if you're using the moon to try to use a calendar, and there's a hundred calendars out there, people. If you think that you're going to use the moon, it tells you in the last days the moon's going to go off course. I know right now people think that they're doing the Father, or they're doing out of love, they're trying to keep these things. It's great to learn about them. But the Torah is very clear about how they are to be kept. And if they're not being kept properly, it's like keeping the Sabbath day on a Sunday. Be careful, right? As your knowledge increases, I'm not trying to lay a stumbling stone before anybody. If you don't know any better out of the goodness of your heart and you're trying to do stuff for the Father, that's fantastic. You're learning. You're learning all the things that you're going to be going, uh, going to be keeping on the new earth for a thousand years. That's why learning all of this is important understanding how sacrifices work. People think there's going to be no sacrifices on the thousand, in the thousand year reign. What about Passover? Passover is going to be kept. There has to be a lamb for Passover, does there not? No, I'm not an Adventist. I'm not any of these. I'm not a Christian. I'm not a Catholic. I'm not a Baptist. I'm none of these things. I'm a follower of this book, the way. I'm a follower of my Messiah's word, the Father's word right? Again, I came out of all of that religion nonsense. And when you come out of the religion and the indoctrination, you will start realizing very quickly that you've been lied to. The father says, come out of her, my people, lest you partake in her plagues. He's talking about the churches, the great whore that's drunken with the blood of the saints. You better get out of those churches, people. They're going to be pulling you out of those churches and unaliving you in the churches and outside of the churches come mid-tribulation when Satan has the power and the, and the authority to do it worldwide or planet-wide, I'd like to say. I don't like using the, the term world, but either way, you guys that are in denial about this stuff, stay in denial. Don't say that you weren't warned because every one of us that have been warning and all the people that keep coming up against us, we're going to stand as a witness against you one day and not in a good way. So will the children of those that are mixing seed with other nations. Their children are going to stand and witness against them. It's just what it is. If you read the Maccabees and all through the prophets, even, if you don't want to get into the Maccabees, just read the prophets. Read the book of Nehemiah. When Nehemiah started rebuilding the walls, they pulled out the genealogies, and anybody that was married to people outside of Israel 
had to leave their wives and their children. They couldn't stay within the walls of, of uh, Nehemiah because of that. And this is in every book. So people get upset about all of this. They get their feelings involved. And mostly I get a lot of the people that fight it are people that have done it. But there's also a lot of people that have done that and they've come out of it and they understand it because they've studied it. So I pray that people will see and their eyes will be open, but I realize that not many will. For you Christians, they don't follow Jesus. Yes, I don't believe in the name of Jesus. Guys, the name Joshua was translated properly all throughout this book. When it comes to the Messiah's name, what did they change it to? Jesus. Why? Why didn't they translate it as Joshua? I said this the other day, let those who have understanding calculate the number of the beast for it is the number of a man. It is not 666, people. John was on the Isle of Patmos and he was not writing in English. Go back to the original first printed, the first three printed Greek Bibles and you're going to see a symbol there that says Kaisi Stigma, which means Jesus Christos, Jesus Christ. The Messiah said, I have come in my Father's name and you receive me not. But if another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. You can either study it out for yourself, you can mock, you can do whatever you want. I really don't care. All that I care about is for those that are listening and doing the work. They're going in and studying. So if you go in and you study, you'll learn. Uh, who are the people? Well, remember, all 12 tribes are scattered. So it... it Trying to figure out what, what country you're in, that's not gonna, that doesn't bear, it doesn't have any bearing on what we're talking about here. All that I'm reading from the KJV, but I study out of the, it's called the scriptures. Um, but I study from probably about seven different translations. And I also use the Hebrew, the Greek, I study the root words, I go back and I really do my due diligence when I study. Even looking up the names and the meaning of the names is super important. People are trusting in these modern day versions of scripture, not realizing how, how badly they've been altered. And the Father has warned us seven times to be careful of the scribes of the lying pen because they've altered the word. They've taken his name out. They've taken entire verses out. They've taken out 18 plus books just from the original copy of the KJV 1611. They removed all of the Apocrypha. The first print of the KJV 1611 had all the Apocrypha in it. The next edition, they took them all out. Then they say, oh, these are just historical books. Now, if you've studied them, they're not. Not to mention, to this day, what did Moses, Moses ruled over the Cushite people, right? He was king over them. Guess what's still in the Ethiopian Bible to this day? The book of Enoch. Only here in the West are we so dumbed down by these modern day churches and we get pumped with all of this nonsense. Oh, if you sow a seed, you're going to be blessed. The Father's going to bless you. But these are the same people telling you you don't have to keep the law while they're asking you for tithe money. While they're flying around in private jets and living in God, I don't even know how much they spend on their mansions and houses. You think these people care about you? Do some research on all of them. Find out who they really are. Find out who they truly work for and who they answer to. And if you're looking for where the Antichrist is going to come from, it's not America. You guys need to be looking over at the place that runs this place. And there are books that describe what he'll be like, what the Antichrist won't be able to do. There's one thing that he will not be able to do which is raise the dead because he doesn't have the power to give life. But he'll be able to do everything else. He'll be able to do miracles in front of people. He'll be able to darken the sun, turn the sun into blood, turn the moon into blood. The deception is going to be thick and people are going to fall for it. Most already are under the delusion. Most won't even come out. Most people are so overwhelmed that they just say, ah, I can't do this anymore. I'm done. 
It's up to you to endure till the end. Study to show thyself approved. So with that, guys, I have to get off of here. I've got to go. I'm glad that we were able to get through the entirety of it. But again, maybe one day when we have more time, I have this entire Shabbat free. So uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and all pretty much all day Sunday, I'll have time to come on here and do teachings. We can go into more depth with the arrows, with the sword, with the grass, the trees, the fruit. We can break down all of these key words and we can start learning. And then you guys can go test it for yourselves and find out whether it's truth or not. And again, like I said, don't believe a word I say. Do not trust any man. Put your trust in the Father. And if you're going to listen to a man, you better test everything that man is saying if you're putting your trust in him. And guys, I thank you for the gifts. You don't have to do that. But also, I want to bring up one other thing. I am considering starting a website. If you guys are, are aware, uh, TikTok's shutting down the night before January 1st at midnight. This app is the only app that we have that has been giving us insight as to what's going on around the whole world. Don't you think it's a little bit strange that November 5th is election time and then all the way up to January 1st, which is the inauguration, that they're going to cut this app off? I am going to try to start a website, but I'm going to need help. I will design the website and build it myself. But if you guys want to stay in touch, we have to have some sort of way to, to communicate back and forth, a way where we can speak. And I see other people that have started websites and they can't control that, right? Because you have people that the Church of Satan, they have a website. You have corn websites. You have all kinds of stuff. So we can push this as far as we want. But if you guys want to keep in touch, that's probably going to be the only way we're going to be able to do it because they're going to start censoring everything very soon. And we're not going to make it through this election without major stuff going on. The, the, the election night, maybe, right? But I'm talking from November 5th all the way to January 1st. And then what happens after January 1st, I don't even want to think about. But I can tell you it's not going, nobody, it doesn't matter for all the prayer warriors out there that say, oh, we can get together and we can pray and we can turn back Yahweh's wrath. No, you can't. What's coming has been prophesied to happen and all of the signs and all of the prophets, they're all coming to pass. Everything that's in this book, that's why it's important to know prophecy because you can watch as the prophecies are unfolding and you know exactly where you're at in the timeline of events. We're in Revelation chapter 6 right now. Those seals are, have been opened. The first four seals, they're open. And those things are slowly going to increase as the birth pains increase. And once the birth pains are over and that child is delivered, tribulation begins. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. When Michael, the restrainer, is removed out of the way, chaos begins. Because that's what Michael is set over. The best part of mankind and chaos. These books are no longer sealed. That's also Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. O, o Daniel, seal up the book, even till the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. There's a reason why these books are no longer sealed books. For some. Be careful of those that are shepherding people away from truth. These people that are too cowardice to join us live and have a conversation, but they'll make videos and talk. I've, I've heard all kinds of crazy stuff that are coming out of these groups. Be very, very careful, people. Your trust should be first and foremost in the Father's word, not men's opinions. And the Father will reveal anything to you. All you have to do is ask, but you can't just go and say, Father, show me everything in Scripture, and then your heart is to go live in the world. You're going to have to go through the separation of your flesh and relying on the Father's Spirit. And I can tell you right now that's a painful process. Detaching from everything in the world and even the people that you love, they're not going to like you very much after you do that. You're going to lose family members, friends, all kinds of stuff. And then before the Father opens the Word, once you go into covenant with the Father and you get baptized... You have remission of sin, then you receive the Father's Spirit. It's the, the Son that mediates for us. He's the one in the middle. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You get the, the gift of the Spirit, the Father can communicate with us, but it has to be through the mediator, the Son. Right? 
So if you're not in covenant with the Father, you need to get in covenant with him. You need to be baptized by somebody who's keeping the Torah and knows the Torah. Then you have remission of sin. Then you receive the gift of the Spirit. If you don't have the Father's Spirit dwelling in you, don't expect this book to unlock for you. It's not that he won't lead you and guide you and open your eyes. He will, because he knows that every man that has been called and predestined is going to make it. He, he already His plans are already laid out. This is why I'm baffled by these men that are going around and beating people up, uh, not, not physically, but they're going into churches and calling these pastors out and cussing them out. And they act like they're the ones that are going to wake these people up and they're not doing anything aside from making people angry, right? So... Can I baptize? If you're a woman, you cannot baptize yourself. But if you are a man, you're the prophet of your own home. Yes, you can, but I wouldn't recommend it. You need to find someone in your area. Uh, you guys can contact. I don't know how much longer he's going to be here in the U.S. Real dot scriptures, Emmanuel. Um, you can send him a private message. He's currently going around baptizing people. I will probably be doing the same here soon myself. Um, but my my most important thing that I want to express to everyone. Don't go rush out to get baptized because if you rush out to get baptized and you're not fully prepared, no, number one, none of us will baptize you unless we know that you understand what you're getting into because your blood will be upon our hands if we baptize you and you go back to your old ways, right? And not necessarily to that degree. It's up to every man to work out his own salvation, but I won't baptize somebody that doesn't have a basic understanding of what going into covenant with the Father is, and I have to see that their heart is set on keeping the Father's commandments and walking in His ways by following His Son's footsteps. But once you do that, understand every sin that you sin after that is counted against you. So you can either build up your treasures in heaven, or you can start going back to your old ways after being baptized. And after you do that, guys, when you go into covenant with the Father and you start breaking promises, you're going to be tipping the scales when the Messiah returns. So you better make sure. I know time is short, but you better be very, very careful. Yes, I did say women cannot baptize. They're not supposed to be baptizing men. And that's that's biblical. There's a, there's a Godhead. The Father, the Son, man, woman, child. That's the Godhead. It's not a trinity. I see women baptizing men, and it shouldn't be happening. Women are not supposed to be preaching either. Women can share the gospel with other women, but women are not supposed to be preaching. Nowhere in scripture are you going to see the Father using women to preach the word. Men are designed for war, for preaching, for protecting. You guys can go around that if you want. Good luck. The only time the Father used a prophet or pr women that were prophets is when the men were too weak to stand up and do anything about it. So he had to show them, look, I'm going to use a woman because you guys are acting just like the women. And I designed you to be the leaders. That's what's going on right now all over the place. Men that are claiming to be men acting like women. Which is liberalism. It's liberal-minded men. So with that, I've got to go, guys. I hope you guys have an excellent day. And I will see you guys more than likely Friday or on Shabbat. Um, I did talk to Jason about trying to finish Enoch, but if we don't get a chance to do it Friday, we won't be able to do it this weekend because he's got uh, some stuff he's trying to take care of. But it doesn't mean that I can't come on. Maybe Michael will join me and maybe we can do a teaching that way or something like that. But I plan on being on here on, uh, on Shabbat. So I'll see you guys then. Hope you guys have a blessed day. Shalom.